Hello YouTube viewers, Paul Hamler here. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to do the first of three uh, videos that address some of the tooling that I'm involved, got involved in in manufacturing my latest miniature project, which is a one eleventh scale of a Monarch 10 E lathe. Uh, in front of you, you see uh, a Manson lathe that was made back in the 50s. Uh, these were actually operational lathes. They would power feed and had the, the hand crank. You could manually feed it. I hope to put the same function in my 111 scale as what was captured in the Manson. However, I'm striving for a little more detail. My ultimate goal, if possible, on the screen saver here, <laughs> or the background, is a picture I pulled off the internet of a full-size Monarch 10 E lathe. I'm striving, when my miniature is finished, that I should be able to take a picture of it without any scale reference and not tell it's a miniature. It's a, that's what I'm trying to accomplish, as well as putting the same function in my lathe as in that came in the Manson lathe. What I did a few years back, I bought an old clunker Monarch 10 E lathe and uh, basically drew 95% of the components, the, in the external components, and made uh, STL files of them and started 3D printing the, uh, the files. What you see here is the uh, example of uh, my scale. It's going to be again one level, five and a half, five and a quarter inches uh, in the end. Whereas the Manson, I believe it was uh, nine and a half, somewhere in that neighborhood. The uh, the little. Let me zoom in. The uh, the main function or the main topic of this video is going to be discussing how to make an extremely small cutter that enabled me to mill the six brass plates that are, you know make it, that are applied on the that were on the original Manson lathe. You see in this shot here, there's one of the Monarch tag, and you know it's to scale. It was milled with a custom uh, ground dental burr that we'll be discussing how to do today. The little one on the right, basically all that was, was I was testing all of my STL files and I didn't want to, you know, waste a lot of printer time, so I chose to just print the pieces uh, at a lot smaller scale. And uh, so I had good files, so now I knew it was, you know, ready to progress to doing the, the big 3D printed files. Uh, we'll take a look at some of those files in a second, and I'll share with you how I tune those files up and, and make them uh, perfect files or, or a, lot, a lot crisper than what's coming off of my $600 CR10 3D printer machine. The fact that I had all of the plates off of my machine that I bought to use as a model uh, I was able to photograph them and using a program called MOI, Moment of Inspiration, I was able to draw and scale them down to the size that I wanted and then uh, I generated two paths for machining them in another piece of software. But uh, all of these plates uh, were cast bronze in, in this particular era of the Monarch 10 E. I think my machine was a 1943 version, or what they refer to as a round dial. So let me see, try to zoom over here. What you see There's some of the uh, waxes to the left. Uh, there are two moles, RTV moles, and if you want to see the process in manufacturing those moles, I've got a couple of videos out there showing how to do that and how to inject the waxes. What I chose to do is, is once I drew and got the scale I wanted, I made two individual RTV moles, one for the top and one for the bottom. 
and uh, the reason for doing that is uh, it it made it a lot easier to shoot which is a quite quite a large size wax by jewelry or investment casting standards for the jewelry industry so by having the two waxes individual waxes you can see the to the left in front of the molds those were the 3d printed uh, parts which was used as the master for making the molds now what uh, there's two two castings I've, I've done three all together these bronze castings was were the most difficult or the most challenging part of investment casting this product so I figured if I could do that the rest of it is, is going to be fairly easy because stuff I've done for years and years the uh, this the bases are cast in aluminum bronze they weigh one pound it took one and three quarter pounds of bronze to pour and cast these bases what you see on top of the bases is the bed, bed and uh, carriage assembly which were cast in white bronze not very happy with the quality because they were cast from SLA which presents a lot of problems so that's the reason I have chosen to make RTV molds for each individual product so I will recast these bases later on with a higher quality than what I achieved by burning out and casting the PLA okay trying to zoom in and get a better shot here of these uh, the, again there were six of them and there's also a a tachometer in the assembly here that's that's the face of the tachometer and in a later video we'll be discussing uh, developing or making a cutter that will enable you to do fine detail drag engraving as seen on that face of that tachometer now the the gray pieces on the back are made out of a material called metapore and it's a porous alu aluminum type uh, modeling material they also use it for making vacuum chucks uh, the reason I went ahead and machined some out of metapore was I will make RTV molds of these and shoot waxes and see if uh, the castings are a little more realistic looking than the rest of the plates that you see which were machined uh, on stock brass in this video there will be several inserts in the video describing what they are because some of the stuff is so small my my camera is just not equipped for doing macro and uh, but as the video is edited and produced you will see close-up shots of all of not all of them but a, a lot of these pieces so you can examine the tool path and see uh, what they look like after they came off the mill now the this guy right here is the what I refer to as the model tag it's it's gives you the information of when the, when the machine was made, this, the swing of the bed and a, and a few other things, the date it, date it was manufactured. The one to the left, which is darkened, uh, is the same, same plate that was machined on the mill and uh, is on the rest of them after, after they were machined I put the brat the casewood birch birchwood cases uh, brass black on there and what it would do is blacken the background and the top portions the high portions of the letters could be wiped with a, uh, a stone and then you would get the same effect as you had it on the original so uh, I was quite happy the way they turned out and uh, with that said, let's take a look at some of the other parts that's going to be associated with this lathe. You know, the first part I, I want to zoom in on here is uh, the apron with the hand crank wheel and the couple of accoutrements that associated making up the uh, 
the apron. One thing that's not has not been included yet, and you can see the hole in the cavity in the 3D printed part right here. If what will be in there will be a all sight. It'll be uh, nickel plated around the ring, and it'll have a clear uh, glass uh, face on it. And there's four other all sights on the, the headstock and the transmission that uh, will also be made. They're all they're all redundant. But uh, the uh, I've lost count, to be honest with you, how many parts. Uh, I think I'm up to about uh, 30, 35 or 40 parts before it's all said and done. Some of the parts that will be machined will be, uh, will probably be up in the count somewhere around 70, 75 parts for this uh, finished product. What you see here are uh, individual sized PVC pipes that have a one and a half degree taper inside and each in front of each uh, mold frame is the parts that will go in that corresponding uh, mold frame behind it. Now the uh, quality of the 3D printed parts that I'm achieving off of my CR10 which is a FDM type printer you know, there some depending on the geometry of the parts, some of them are crisper than others. When you get down into the tiny, tiny parts, they they lose a lot of crispness. So here, let me tell you about a product here I just recently discovered. It's called Solar Ease, and what it is is a UV curing, a UV cured lacquer. You can literally take. Uh, and brush on, and I use a little foam brush, brush on this UV cleared lacquer which has a viscosity similar to some of the early polyurethane uh, varnishes. But you brush it on and either put it under a UV light for about two minutes or take it out in the bright sunlight and that lacquer is in about two minutes is rock hard. Then it sands and sculpts beautiful so by using this process, I can take some of the less desirable 3D printed parts, put a coat of solar ease on them, sand them, and then I will prime them with a fine primer. And uh, I end up with some pretty crisp parts. Now obviously, uh, I don't need to tell you this, but the crisper your part, uh, the crisper your mold is going to be. Try to get this thing in focus. You you can't you can't see it too well, but this uh, this part right here, which is the cap or the top of the headstock, because of the bill layers of the geometry, the way it was printed, it, it really had a nasty finish on it. Well, just a little touch up with the solar ease, and uh, a little sanding. And spray primer, I've got an extremely crisp part for making my RTV mold. For those of you familiar with the uh, 19th miniature, 1911 I did a couple years ago, this was the exact same process I used. I got, the only difference was I had such a high quality of 3D printed parts because they were printed on a $300,000 machine. I didn't have to do any touch up at all to the printed parts. I just had to make the custom molds and make RTVs and shoot the waxes. So with that said, I think what we're going to do is, is go over and uh, I'm going to show you how to uh, sharpen a dental burr and convert it into a a miniature, I'm going to call it an end mill, it's not really an end mill, but I think you'll be real impressed uh, how well they cut. Matter of fact, in, in one of the videos uh, following this one, we're going to make a brooch out of a 34 thousandths flat to flat Allen wrench. We're going to make that brooch out of the Allen wrench and in part of the manufacturing process of this, we will be using the cutter that we sharpened today, which is going to be about a 2,000s tip, uh, you know, end mill. And uh, 
the reason I had to go, go down that small on the brooch in keeping with scale, uh, the apron will be attached to the saddle there with eight socket head cap screws, so I need the, the smaller cap screws, you know, to pull off the scale. So let's go over to the grinder here and see if we can't sharpen up a, uh, a tiny cutter. What we're looking at here is a homemade uh, cutter sharpener I made for using with uh, my uh, graver sharpener. Patented as well as the Steve Lindsay uh, graver sharpener, which I helped develop. And uh, basically, it's a three phase C frame motor. It's just got a, a, a disc mounted to it for setting your uh, your various grit diamond plates. We'll be using this in conjunction with an NSK high speed handpiece. What we're going to be doing to make to make these two, I've, I've actually made one as small as one and a half thousandths, but uh, and I'll show you how. I determine the cutting width of them later on. But uh, in conjunction with using the NSK handpiece and the spinning uh, plate diamond disc, these discs come in different grits. Uh, just Google diamond, diamond plates, I believe. Uh, they're not that difficult to track down. But I have an assortment. Now, if you don't want to go to the trouble to make uh, a more permanent grinding fixture, what you could do is get you an arbor as shown here and put that arbor on your disc, mount this in your drill press and lower it down to the table to your desired working height and uh, it's an inexpensive way to take a disc and put it in your drill press and you've got the same purpose. You've got a diamond disc that's, that's spinning around for attaching or attacking your tool that you wish to sharpen. Okay. We will also, after the first operation, and I was not kidding in the video, you could do one of these in less than 30 seconds. Uh, this is a diamond lap. They come in three different grits. It's, it's called uh, Easy lap, we'll be using this to tip off the cutter. Uh, one of the reasons that these cutters have been so successful, I used them for years for doing background removal uh, on engravings to give you a depth. When we sharpen this cutter, as you're going to see how we sharpen it, uh, it's a very aggressive cutter for getting in small places. But it didn't occur to me that I could mount this in my 30,000 RPM CNC mill and use it just like an end mill. It worked fantastic. Uh, in the introduction video, the name tags that you saw, some of the small ones, I will take a picture and post it in the video, where I actually made a plate that had 14,000 letters and the background was removed about 6,000 and it was all cut with one cutter uh, just by keeping it flooded with uh, cutting fluid to keep it cool. They're a very effective small end mill, if you want to call them that. It also has a secondary purpose where if you're doing wire inlay in mother of pearl or in steel, you could use this tool as sharpened as a drill and you could go in and manually just uh, drill your undercuts in your mother of pearl or your steel where you're, you're creating pockets for the gold to go down in as you tap it in and to lock it into your, your, your pre-cut channel. So, we are using dental burrs and, and I was calling the more modern style. Uh, these dental burrs uh, there, ask your dentist, see if he'll give you some old dull ones, because you're not going to use them as is, but most all of these modern dental burrs have carbide tips on them. 
And what this does, when you're making a cutter, a two, two to five thousandths cutter, these, this style cutter is a lot more rigid and uh, less likely to break. As a matter of fact, I think I've only broke one uh, since I've been fooling with these things. You've got to go out of your way to break the little carbide uh, dental burr. This is, uh, uh, and again, I will have a picture, but here's a, uh, a single lip cutter that's typically used in the pantograph industry. And I will have a, a macro shot that I will be showing the this cutter, which a single lip cutter is, I think it was about four thousandths in width, and I'll have it beside one that we're fixing to grind at two thousandths, and you can see the the comparison of the geometry of the two cutters. So uh, let me see. I'll try it first with the camera in the position that it's in, and if not, I'll have to stop and, and get, get set up with a camera. But uh, what we're going to do is take, we'll just, whichever one comes out here, I don't know whether it's going to be a ball end mill or, a, or what I call a, a regular straight, straight cutting mill. Okay, here's a ball end mill. What we're going to do is put this in the NSK handpiece, which as I remember, I think this, this handpiece is capable, capable of turning up somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 300,000, 400,000 RPM. I'd have to go check the specs on it. But it moves out faster than your typical Dremel tube. If you don't have uh, an air engraver like this, Here's a motorized version. It doesn't go quite as uh, fast. Here's the, the control unit uh, for the motorized uh, handpiece, the electric handpiece. I have used, just to see if it would work, I have used with a collet a Dremel tool running as fast as they will go for this first operation with success. Uh, obviously, with a precision handpiece like this at the high RPM, you're going to get a little bit finer product, but it is doable with a Dremel tool. And uh, again, you could even you know make your platter, put it on your disc or on your drill press. So what we're going to do is we're going to fire up this VFD that runs the motor here, and as it's turning, and I'm going to step on a pedal down here on the floor and get it over here, and I'm going to fire up the uh, the handpiece. So we're going to hold it on here against the rotating disc and in a matter of probably 10-15 seconds what it's going to do is the diamond cutter uh, diamond pad here is going to cut that carbide down and bring that ball end mill on the carbide cutter, the standard cutter, it's going to bring it down to an absolute needle point. Okay, turn on the VFD Take the NSK, hold it about 10 to 15 degrees. I'm stepping on the pedal, I'm spinning it. We have an extremely sharp needle point on this, what was a carbide mill. Now, let's take it off. We're going to take it over to the uh, engraving vise here in the microscope and do the second operation of this process. Device level, I'm going to stick this uh, pointed carbide cutter in the jaws, and the jaws are facing me with the cutter installed at roughly 10, 15 degrees. That establishes one angle of the two-step uh, tipping off or cutter relief process. The second angle, I'm going to come down with this flat uh, diamond hone and very gently touch the tip and with light pressure stroke it about three quarters to one inch. That's all that's going to be required to convert that zero needle point. <coughs> in about a two thousandths tip width. 
So laying it down, let me get the microscope set up here. Okay. If that's my wife, tell her I'm not here. Never fails. Okay, here we go. Ow. Gotta be careful, it'll catch you. So, now I have about, a, I'd say a couple thousandths tip width on that, what was a point. And uh, just as a quick check without setting it up in the mill, usually what I do is put it in a, put it back in the hand piece. And get a piece of uh, this is mellow. It's, it's a prototyping board. It's called melamine, and I can tell right away it's cutting very aggressive. Take a piece of brass. Go in here, cutting extremely well. So, I guess the point is. It's quick and it's dirty, and what I normally will do is I'll, I'll do 10 or 12 of these at one time, keep them in a, a little container, but uh, this will go in the mill, and it'll act like a, well, what, what you have to do is, is, is just make a trial cut and verify the, for your required depth, 4,000, 5,000, whatever, you measure, make a straight cut and measure the uh, the tip width and see if it's within the range that you're looking for that you have programmed into your G code for your step over. These are rugged little cutters and uh, now if you don't have dental burrs, if you've got some extremely small uh, fluted uh, end mills, say a, you know a 30 second, 64, somewhere down in that range, uh, when one breaks, you take that thing and usually they break up at where the cutting flutes are and you've got enough of a stub, non-spiral cutter left on that. You can go in there and grind it down to a needle point, tip it off just like I did. You know, Remember, cock it in the vise about 10, 15 degrees, lightly come across there. Now, if, you wanna, if you're doing background removal on some big uh, engraving, you can stroke that thing a couple of times and you can watch that tip under the microscope grow from a couple of thousands up to four or six. Uh, I don't think I've ever made one wider than ten thousandths. But uh, it, the, the process is the same. You've got the clearance cut on the bottom of it. Later on in your engraving, if you uh, tip this thing, get rid of your tip and uh, flatten it so there's no uh, compound angle at the bottom, you can use the sides of these cutters for polishing the edges of your relief where you've already pocketed it out. So uh, with that said, let's move the camera for our next operation here. We're going to wrap this thing up and uh, bring it to end. As I said earlier, I will post some uh, digital camera, microscopic camera pictures of the cutters that will be in, in the video. But uh, just a little preview of what's coming up in the next two videos. What you see in front of you is uh, a drag, spring-loaded drag engraver. It's made out of, uh, again, a, a carbide tip dental burr. And you can see the tachometer that was scratched in in the uh, the black and the, as it was scratched, it was showing the white background. And then there's a piece of uh, alternative ivory that's been scratched uh, with some artwork for a money clip. So we'll discuss how to make this uh, particular spring-loaded drag engraver in the, the next video. Here's a, an example of some, some work that's been done with these uh, small carbide tip dental burr uh, mills. The one on the left, uh, I kind of pushed the limits 
And it, I, I'll be honest with you, it took more than 30 seconds, but I did get one tipped off at about uh, just a little over one and a quarter thousandths. And I used it to engrave the vice grip logo on this pair of miniature vice grips. The one in the center was machined out of that melamine board, and it, uh, it's a three-dimensional relief engraving of a watchmaker's lathe for a, a club meeting we had. And it was done with one of these cutters. My friend Jim Small used uh, one to do his background removal on the uh, engraving coin to the right. And uh, anyway, that's probably enough about that. Now, what the next video, uh, what we're going to do is use the tool that we just sharpened in this video. And I'm going to show you how to take that tool and make a hex brooch that will broach a socket head cap screw. Again, the width is uh, 34 thousandths of the uh, flat to flat. So that will be the second video that will follow up with the drag engraving. So have a good day and talk to you later. Bye.